Welcome to BizTech's C-Suite Conversation Show. Today, we're going to look at the role of the CFO, how the role has evolved, and how different CFOs from different regions view their priorities. Now, to bring an expert lens on this, we have with our guest today, Christopher Black. He's the partner at the Hydric and Struggles Tokyo office and regional managing partner of the corporate offices practice of Asia Pacific and the Middle East. Now to tell us more, Chris, welcome to the show. Brian, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Now, Chris, for a start, how has the role of the CFO evolved over the last few years, especially given the complexity of managing organizations, which has increased really exponentially? Uh, absolutely, and I think, the last few years, we've seen this accelerate even more, uh, which was uh, trends that were already ongoing. But the role has really shifted to being uh, both extremely strategic, close to the business, and having to deal with uh, complexities far beyond just reporting and control, and even the traditional FP&A. Um, it, it is a far more complex role today. And of course, you mentioned the point about regional differences and where, from where I sit, it's it's always very evident that CFOs in the United States and in Europe are living in one reality um, uh, and CFOs in Asia and the Middle East um, are still, and this depends on the company, of course, but if I were to generalize, are still at, a, at an earlier stage of that, uh, that sort of curve. Um, but have real opportunities, I think, and we can get into that uh, thanks to technology to to maybe leapfrog and um, and and shift um, finance uh, in their organizations as well. Okay, so let's zoom in on what you've just said. Give us some really key differences in terms of cultural nuances, in terms of the the lens of the uh, North American CFO versus the lens of the 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 Japanese CFO. Well, I think fundamentally, the progress of finance from being, let's say, simplistically just accounting to being a value added business partner has been ongoing in the US and Europe for, for many years uh, and is, is fairly sophisticated now. In Japanese companies, I think also more broadly in East Asian companies, um, many of them, it is still by and large an accounting uh, function. And the leading companies are beginning that shift or have started that shift. And what's particularly exciting, I think, for us uh, about that trend is that we see those companies realizing themselves the need for change and that it will be driven by having the right talent. So if you look at Japanese companies that have traditionally always grown talent from within, um, they are beginning uh, to look outside for, for their next CFO, um, prompted by the fact that their businesses are global, their investor bases are global, um, and they face the same complex challenges as their competitors in, in Europe and the US. So it's, it's an exciting time, and I think many Japanese companies are sort of at a, at a watershed moment from that perspective. Now, that is really interesting because, as you said, they, they tend to grow their own timber. And it's also a trust, a, a factor that elevates someone to that CFO level because it, of, of its, its uh, significance. So it's, it's, it's interesting that you said that they're now open to then bring people from the outside in order to help them compete better. How are you seeing this in, say, for example, your Middle East practices? They have obviously less legacy. They're more likely to bring yeah. in people from outside. Absolutely. And if I look at our business in the Middle East, it has long been a, a market where we helped clients import, let's say, uh, the best talent uh, that they could get from typically Europe, um, but but also the rest of the world. And that trend, I would say, is only accelerating uh, if you look at what's going on in Saudi, uh, in the rest of uh, the Middle East, uh, particularly the uh, the UAE, et cetera. Um, so that is, and, and this is very often 
we see the emergence of regional company, uh, re yeah, regional champions, regional companies from the Middle East who are looking east towards Asia, south towards Africa for growth, um, and bringing leadership in from large blue chip companies, um, and uh, they're able to attract them because of the prospects. And and so this is really interesting because obviously it's so. That's a great insight that the regional champions in the Middle East are now looking out, whereas traditionally they have been more inwardly focused. And I'm sure that that's also driven by the talent that they have brought in that have perhaps culturally changed the organization from within. I believe so. And I think when I reflect on back to this market, what I'm hopeful about is precisely this trend towards bringing in global talent in this market, it's typically still Japanese talent, but uh, executives who have grown up in Western multinationals or who have spent significant parts of their career abroad, coming back and bringing those skills, that, that global agility, cultural agility, back to more traditional companies and, and transforming them. And uh, to your point, I think that will also um, unleash some potential uh, for those companies to compete globally um, and be more successful. Chris, one of the key things that's happened in the last 12 months in particular is really Japan has become the flavor of the month or the flavor of the year. So ever since Warren Buffett decided to invest in the Sogo Soshas, money has poured into Japan Japan is also opening a new uh, a casino, uh, 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 which yes. is uh, will be up later in this decade. So, is there really a fundamental shift you think um, that's happening within Japan that perhaps Japan has this new dawn after thirty years of melees? It's a very good question, um, which uh, we would all like to know the answer to. I think, but <laughs> I think that the on the one hand, I think there's a very strong positive fundamentals around just the amount of investable assets in Japan, the strength of companies, the potential for digital transformation to make those companies more uh, efficient and competitive. Uh, you have to weigh that against demographics, which, which are sort of non-negotiable um, and which mean that GDP growth will be hard to find, and and that's why Japanese companies are big acquirers of of companies, particularly in the rest of Asia, but but of course also looking to 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 Africa and Latin America, uh, where they can they can find growth. Okay, so that's an interesting phenomena. So, give us uh, uh, through your experience what you've seen in terms of Japanese companies now in the last couple of years, shifting their focus towards M&As outside of Japan in order to grow their business. And, and perhaps you could start, I mean, you, you talked about all the different regions. Maybe you could break it down a little bit for us. Yeah, I, I would say that historically and also today and, and from sort of speaking to M&A advisors in the market, Southeast Asia is uh, is probably the the most broadly attractive market, I would say, or the focus of many Japanese companies due to proximity, uh, but also the growth potential in, in the region. Um, and then I think the larger businesses and those that have interest in maybe infrastructure and energy and agriculture and so on may also be looking to Africa. Um, and then with across the Pacific, I think there's there's always been a closeness to um, some of the Pacific Latin American countries uh, where there are also Japanese uh, immigrant populations. Exactly. They're very large in, in places like uh, uh, Peru, Uruguay, uh, Brazil. There's a large indigenous Japanese population. Yeah. yeah. So, but there's also a different m &A trend, which, which is starting to emerge, which is a domestic one. So there's a large amount of SMEs in Japan, which basically have no successor and the owners are looking to sell their businesses. This is not a very well-known fact out of Japan, but that is a key problem within Japan, which is also then an opportunity. Chris, could you share some, some insights into this phenomena and where the opportunities are? 
Sure. Um, you're right, first of all, that it, it is a um, it's a potentially huge trend or opportunity. I think uh, it is generational change driven. Um, and I think one clear beneficiary of this will be private equity firms. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there's a huge inflow of capital or capital being directed towards the Japanese market. And the fact that there are going to be more companies, more assets for sale um, uh, is inherently attractive to, to, to those who want to deploy capital here. Um, and it, it could also be uh, an opportunity for, for foreign companies who want to establish a base here or acquire a, a good company. Um, you know, back to the point about the positive sides of the current Japan story, it, part of this, this uh, generational change is also the release of all that capital, um, which will further strengthen the investment management industry, um, you know, potentially the whole entrepreneurial uh, fundament here. Um, so it's, it's, it's very exciting. Now, what are some key priorities for Japanese CFOs for, for 2024, 2025? I think it's a good question. Um, I would distinguish, first of all, between CFOs of Japanese companies and then the CFOs of Western global multinationals operating here. Um, we've sat down recently with, with people, you know, members of both those categories, and I would say that they they share some of the same priorities. I would maybe highlight three: so transformation, recruiting and and developing finance talent, and then getting better at supporting the business in this this complex uh, market that we're operating in right now. Um, and then depending on whether you're a see the CFO of a Japanese company or a CFO of a multinational here, you're probably weighting those uh, priorities slightly differently. Um, for the CFO of a, of a Western multinational operating here, you're probably fairly far on the transformation curve, um, running a reasonably efficient finance organization using robotics and process automation, et cetera. Maybe you're playing with AI. Uh, to figure out whether you can use that in business partnering. Um, so the focus is probably more on the, the business partnering. How do you support uh, the, the, the growth of the business uh, in Japan? For the Japanese company CFO, as we, we talked about earlier, you're likely to be defining transformation more broadly uh, in terms of the shift of finance from being backward looking, accounting focused to being that strategic partner. Um, and again, there are leading companies in Japan that are far on that journey. And then there are others that are catching up. Um, but it is it is um, encouraging and, and, and I would say uh, very uh, sometimes incredible that that these companies, even more traditional ones, are realizing this out of you know their their own sort of motivation. Um, that with foreign investors, uh, with global business, um, they they need a, a different kind of talent. Uh, so they're driving that change themselves in many cases. But one of the challenges and the the impediment for this really is the fact that. Japan is generally, from a talent perspective, a relatively insular market. So your pool is very, very limited. Are you seeing, and, and this obviously is very, very different from, say, your other area of responsibility, the Middle East, where talent comes from everywhere. Yeah. It's completely the opposite. Are you seeing any sort of fundamental change in this area, or basically the companies have to work within the pools that they have? It's a huge challenge. Um, and again, speaking with CFOs from both the Japanese companies and the Western multinationals, where they are most alike is uh, in their in the fight for talent and and the challenges they face there. For the Western multinationals, it's really the question of how do you provide a, a, a an attractive career path to someone here when mobility is less likely to, uh, you know, people are less mobile today. It's going to be hard to export Japanese talent to, to other parts of the world. So how do you create a meaningful career path? For the Japanese companies, they're 
you know, often struggling to compete with compensation levels offered by um, global multinationals. Um, and then also with the cultural aspect of bringing someone into the business, which is uh, traditionally, you know, recruited new grads and grown them and therefore often have quite sort of uh, strong cultures uh, that are not used to uh, bringing in outsiders. Um, so the talent pool is challenging. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that those two worlds, the worlds of the Western multinationals and the Japanese companies, feel like they're converging um, in that they're competing for the same talent. Uh, and I think we'll see much more fluidity across those two, many more people who grew up working for leading American or European companies and their careers in CXO roles in Japanese companies. Um, and, uh, and and vice versa. I think there's just going to be more sort of movement back and forth. Now, Chris, just for the benefit of the audience, would you have on top of your mind a, an example of a Japanese company that perhaps has really gone through this transformation journey in the last couple of years in terms of, of really perhaps changing the compensation structures, bringing in more outside talent, and then rejuvenating the business? I can I can think of several off the top of my head. Um, one exciting case I think is uh, is Olympus, um, uh, which today... which had the scandal. Sorry, which had the scandal many years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes uh, maybe you need you need some some kind of event to to trigger change. Um, most people know Olympus as a the camera maker. Um, they actually sold that business. They sold their scientific instruments. Today, it's purely med tech. But actually, something like two thirds of the leadership team are are global executives, um, which reflects the makeup of their revenue, which is uh, probably more than two thirds um, global and not 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 in Japan. Um, so you have a very global Japanese company still with a core of R&D and manufacturing here, um, but a leadership team which truly reflects the business. And I think that that's very exciting, um, that if in the future we see more great Japanese companies with leadership and cultures that reflect the global nature of, of their operations. Chris, that's really a great example because I've, I've read a little bit about Olympus. I, I, I know the backstory around it, but it's great that how they've been able to put that legacy behind them and then really tr transform. Is that a story that's been told in Japan uh, as, as maybe traditional companies may look at that and say, hey, that's maybe the model that we want to go to? I, th I think so. Um, it, there's probably good awareness here of some of these cases, uh, Olympus being one. I think Shiseido is also another one where you see a lot of uh, talent coming from the outside. Um, and, and even some of the traditionally quite conservative financial institutions now are beginning to loosen up and, and, and bringing in executives from outside, including non-Japanese. Um, so I think really changes uh, Changes coming. Now, Chris, it's been a fascinating conversation and I've learned a lot. Uh, but before we leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? I think simply that uh, I think I said it earlier that it feels like a watershed moment uh, here. Um, there's a, there's a, a lot going on uh, from a talent perspective with Japanese companies. Uh, it's a it's a challenging market to to navigate and hire in. Um, but uh, we see more fluidity in the labor market and more opportunities to to hire uh, great talent. Um, so uh, combined with all the attention and focus on Japan, it's an exciting time. Chris, thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show. Thank you, Brian. It was a pleasure. Now, we've been speaking to Christopher Black. He's a partner at Hydric and Struggles Tokyo office and the regional managing partner of the corporate offices practice Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. I'm Brian Fernandez, and this has been Bistax C-Suite Conversation Show. Catch this conversation and much more on Bistax, www.bistax.asia, as well as our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.